Lifting the mask from a local clown, feeling down like Nick Drake, like Vincent van Gogh, never got the chance to enjoy his fame. He released three albums in his short lifetime, all of which failed to find an audience. He died aged just 26, penniless and largely unknown. Forty years later, he has millions of fans around the world and is recognised as one of the true geniuses of English music. He's influenced generations of musicians and now his original producer and manager, Joe Boyd, has brought some of them together to celebrate his enduring legacy. From a local clown, feeling down like him. Seeing the line from a station bar, traveling far and sin. Sailing downstairs to the northern line, seeing the shine of their shoes. Boyd has pulled together an impressive lineup from the worlds of jazz, folk, and pop. Anchoring the house band is Drake's original bass player, Danny Thompson. You know, I've been asked to do, be involved in tributes and things in the past, and I've avoided it. But I think now is the right time, and this tour that's coming up is really important because. It reminds us just how great he was. There are plenty of tragic uh, examples, like Tim Buckley, Mark Boland, Paul Kossoff. And these are genuine tragedies, because you know that if they were allowed that extra time, I don't know, maybe he'd have, he'd have his own minicab company now. <laughs> you know, yes. Him and Sid Vicious. <laughs> you know, you don't know. You, you can only imagine all these things. <laughs> but I just think that's the tragedy. Yeah. The songs that we're recording here that uh, Green Gart Gartside is uh, singing is Fruit Tree, which is that incredibly prophetic song, isn't it, when it comes to, to the lyrics? You know, it never, I don't think it occurred to me that Nick was singing about himself. You know, he's a doomed artist who will be respected and remembered long after he's gone. And it was a fatalistic and interesting point, and, you know, I think I even teased him about it, you know. But I do know that if there was the slightest inkling in his own mind of that applying to him, I can say that by 1973, it wasn't romantic at all. I mean, he was in terrible agony and very, very unhappy and very pained. Safe in your place. Nick Drake's personality wasn't suited to what was expected of a recording artist. Crippled by shyness, he hated performing in front of noisy audiences. In the final years of his life, he became increasingly withdrawn and in 1974 died from a fatal overdose of antidepressants. You know, I was a record producer first and foremost. I managed artists because I didn't see around me managers who understood the kind of artists that I was recording. And so, okay, well, I guess I better manage you. And that worked, and it worked with the Incredible String Band, and it worked with Fairport Convention. And so when it didn't work with Nick, I was flummoxed. 
you know, I didn't have the uh, imagination to figure out plan B or plan C. And it's, it's very uh, haunting. The fact that it, 40 years later, it is, people say timeless, but it is timeless. Why do you think that is? You know, people were singing about cuckoos and blacksmiths, you know, and darling Nancy and all that. And this guy came along with these totally original songs. Yeah. You know, in a time when you had James Taylor, you had loads of singer-songwriters, but he stood out as being someone really special. And that's been proven by the 40 years. He was completely self-taught with his guitar. Do you know where he was coming from in terms of what he had been listening to? When you first heard it, did you think, ah, oh, that's coming from jazz or that's blues why I, or... No. That's was... why I loved it, because I didn't know where it was coming from. And what I've discovered many years later, after his death, um, was his mother, you know, Molly Drake played the piano, and she had a particular way, which I don't know whether it comes from Noel Coward or Flanders and Swan or parlor songs of the middle class, the English middle class from the 30s and the 40s and whatever, mm. but that's what, to my ear, Nick was trying to do with his complicated tunings, was to get his guitar to sound like his mother's piano. But one of the things that you hear in Nick's music, which is also, I think, very strong, is uh, Bossa Nova. I think he was a big, he, he listened to uh, Gilberto. Mm. And he, the way he starts lines, I mean, the vocals, uh, Vashti singing Which Will, you know, almost every line, I think every line in that song starts on the two. Nobody's, you know, it's very unusual. Which will? approach the job of uh, doing a cover of one of his songs kind of with trepidation? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And the thought that he would never sing them live, yes. uh, or that he found it so difficult to sing them live, and then me coming along all of these years later and trying to sing one of his songs. I did find it really, really hard, and to try to learn his phrasing, which is wonderful, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I had to do it the way that I do it. Um, I gave up after a while trying to be Nick. <laughs> I knew that there was not a lot of mileage in that. 